Hey, welcome back to the channel where today I'm going to continue trying to explain how LLMs work. We are focusing on how models are pre-trained. Yes, so in the previous video, I left you off by showing you how models are fine-tuned essentially to become useful uh, agents and helpful chatbots. However, at the end of the day, before that step could happen, the model needs to know how it can actually predict these tokens. And that's where pre-training comes in with self-supervised learning to teach the model its basics, how it can predict the next token. So let's dive into it. Now, in order for you to follow along, I highly recommend if you haven't watched the previous video on inference yet, where we spoke about embeddings and self-attention and logits and how all these things work, I highly recommend watching that first because in this video, I'm going to skim over that part and summarize them in essence because we want to focus on how these models train. When I say these models, the model that we are going to be looking at and the training that's happening is called causal language modeling, sometimes known as the next token prediction or auto regressive modeling. Basically, the objective here is where uh, we want the model to predict the next token given all the previous tokens. And this is the type of training we can do with the decoder only transformer architectures like a GPT, teaching it how to predict that next token. So as you can see, we've got our map like before, where this time we have about nine steps and we're going to go over each step, seeing how data flows and seeing how the process works. So basically, let's start off with the data set. So the data set is extremely important and the type of data that we feed into these models on how they uh, get used to predicting these next words really matters. So the amount of data is massive, right? Trillions of words which gets translated into tokens and then uh, for the model to start training on it can exist of many things, books, articles, websites, code, uh, conversations, and any source of text that we can think of can be fed into the model for training. However, the, the data is then cleaned, deduplicated, uh, filtered uh, for various um, harmful content. And so that leaves us with high quality data that we can pre-process for our training. Now, remember models have billions of sentences that it's going to train on. In our example here, we've got this one paragraph that I'm gonna show you roughly um, how pre-processing works and then how it gets fed through the model for training. And so here is our paragraph that we will use. I went outside to plant a tree in the ground. The sun was warm and the air was calm as I watered it. After covering the roots with soil, I stepped back to admire my work. Now that we have our tiny corpus, really small, this is called our raw material. This needs to now be pre-processed. And the very first thing that happens is tokenization. Remember from the previous video where we tokenize the data, the same step happens here. Tokenization is the step where we take the words and we assign it to a predefined ID. So the tokenizer's job is to assign a mapped ID to each one of these words. And if you can recall, these are not always words. These could be subwords, pieces of, of words. It doesn't always have to be full words. But in our example, here it is. The tokenizer goes and does it for all of our text. And so each one of these IDs, these numeric values in this array, represents the word in the paragraph. For our demonstration purposes, I'm going to keep the paragraph around, but models don't think in words, they only see numbers. So the numbers are the things that gets passed down. Now we've got our tokenized paragraph, roughly about 41 tokens. And so the next step is that we define a few things. Firstly, we define a context window. A context window is simply the amount of tokens that a model can see at any given time. And in our case here, the context window is six, meaning that we have six tokens here in scope. As you can see in the paragraph, we've got I went outside to plant A and in the token representation, the actual thing that the model processes will be these six numerical values. Now, in reality, in real models, these context windows are a bit larger. For example, it can range from a thousand tokens to 4,000 and higher, right? For our example, we only have six, so we can take it in byte chunks and understand the concept rather than seeing what actually happens. But the same principle applies. The context window is defined. 
And so all you need to understand is this definition of the context window is the amount of tokens that a, a model can be trained on at any given time. And it's baked into this architecture. So next, we have to understand how is a model actually going to predict that it's right in predicting the next tokens? How is it going to do this self-supervised learning? Because we're just passing in this paragraph, right? These tokens. So the model needs some sort of goal to work towards to see if it's correct in predicting the next token. And to do that, we simply take our corpus of data, that context window, and shift it up one token. So as you can see here, these are known as our labels. If we had the context window of I went outside to plant A, the label would be went outside to plant a tree. You can see that it's shifted up one to the right here. And the reason why that is happening is so that when we process this data through the model, it's going to predict or try and predict the next token. And this is a way for it to verify at that position if it was correct. And if not, how much was it wrong, which we'll see in later slides. But just understand that labels are defined and it's basically the same context window, but just shifted up. Now, another thing that happens in the data preparation is we define the batch sizes. So you notice this green, uh, the green text over there, we have two batch sizes. That basically tells us how many of these windows we can train in parallel, meaning that the model can process two sequences side by side in one forward pass. Essentially, this helps us train faster. So instead of updating the model with just one example at a time, we can run many at once and average the amount of, you know, loss, which you'll see in the next slides, basically the amount that the model was incorrect and correct itself to update the weights. We can do this in batches. All right, now that we're done with data preparation, just want to sum it up here that we have to find the context window. We also have defined labels, which is our quote unquote goal. And then also we have the batches, right? How many batches we can run at the same time. However, I just want to quickly focus on the input and the labels. So we know that for our context window, we've got the input, which is basically I went outside to plant A and the labels went outside to plant a tree. So if we stack these, we can actually see that the model is going to try and run and when it sees i it knows that it needs to predict the correct token which should be when if it's when it should predict outside and so on if it's a it should predict three so this gives the model the goal which it's going to compare itself at the end now that we have the data prepared it takes the exact same steps uh, that happens in inference so it's really important for you to watch that previous video to understand embeddings and self-attention in detail However, what's different from inference is that when we start off with pre-training a model, the embeddings matrix doesn't really have uh, good values because it's basically uh, not trained, right? So it might get the features wrong. So what happens is the embeddings layer takes these token IDs and tries and assigns a feature vector to it, basically giving it a little bit of meaning and also the position index. And so basically we end up now with an embedding matrix that looks like this for our sequence. Although it might not know about these features yet, it will as it keeps on training. After each token has its own embedding vector right now, knowing the meaning and the position, it goes through self-attention. Self-attention is the process where these embeddings are gonna be looked at, projected into the query a key and value parameters and then by looking at the tokens to the left, it's going to try and figure out what is the meaning of this particular token or this word. And it's gonna add context. So this is the process where we can essentially say that the embeddings vectors gets transferred into more context vectors, holding the meaning, the position, as well as holding the context of that particular token in relation to some of the other tokens and influenced by the other tokens. And we have to remind ourselves here in a brand new model that's not been pre-trained before, going from this embeddings, meaning and position to context vectors is quite a guessing game at this point because it really has not been trained and doesn't know proper context for these tokens. It's still trying to learn and that's what's happening here 
it's trying to take a wild guess and then as it sees that it's wrong, it's going to try and improve itself over time. So just keep that in mind. Now that we have all the context vectors, the next step is for the model to produce raw scores. This is the stage where the model tries and attempts to make some sort of prediction of which the next word would be. Now remember in the inference part when we just had inference and not busy training, we only focused on the last context vector which was A in this case and worked out its raw scores and continued through the process. And just a reminder that each one of these context vectors translates into a full list of vocabulary scores, meaning that the entire vocabulary being at 50,000 tokens, each one of those tokens in that vocabulary gets a score for that specific tokens context. Now, what happens in training, which is different than inference, at this step, we don't only focus on the last token vector, we essentially focus on each token vector in the entire sequence, and each one of them gets the scores worked out. So you end up in this case with our six tokens, six different vocabulary scores that's worked out for the probabilities for each one of their next tokens. Now I say probabilities, but they're not probabilities just yet. You see, these are raw scores for the vocabularies based on the tokens context. So the model feels strongly about certain words in that vocabulary. To get them into probabilities, we need to normalize this data and each one of these vocab lists gets passed and the softmax function is applied to give us actual probabilities, highlighting prominently which uh, words that it thinks it should suggest next. And remember, this happens for each one of those raw scores that was calculated. So here you can just see an example of the token A, its vocab scores and how it's ran through the softmax function. And then we end up with these probabilities on the right. From the looks of it, it's trying to suggest that the word or the token the is the most likely to be next. Now, that seems a bit wrong. And if this is wrong in this case, how do we know that it's wrong? And how can it correct itself? Well, this is where the cross entropy loss comes in. There's a loss function that we can use to calculate this. So let's take a look at what happens next. Well, now that we have the probabilities, we can now bring back our labels. So this process will happen for each one of the tokens. Of course, we've got each one of the tokens probabilities. So the same process happens. For now, let's focus on A and the label tree. As we've seen, we've got the probabilities here on the left for the token A. And it's saying that it thinks the token the with a score of 0.5 should be the most likely to be picked. However, how do we know that that is wrong? Well, we take our label, which is the source of truth. We know that tree should be the right uh, token that should come next. So we take that vocab list and we assign a one and turn all the other tokens in that vocab list to zero. That means that we can now do a comparison to what the uh, probabilities was from the model and the actual truth. So here we can see that we said that tree is correct, but the model predicted 0.06 for tree. And so this is where the loss can be calculated. So by using this equation, we can take the tree, that value, and pass it through uh, minus log and 0.06, and we end up with a score of 2.81. Now, how this loss function works is the higher the amount here, the more wrong the model is. And when I say wrong, I mean it got the prediction for that specific token. It did not really get that one right. So the lower the loss, the better. And that's the whole goal of training is to run the system and get this loss lower almost zero, but not exactly zero. Because if it was to be zero loss, then it means that the system will just spit out exactly what it was trained on and not really be this generative uh, model, right? It needs to have a little bit of creativity and, and, and options to predict, to predict and generate new tokens that we have not seen before. Now, this is just the loss for that specific A to tree. Right? But this happens for each one of the tokens, I and went, outside, 
and two, two and plant, and each one of these individual losses is calculated. And then at the end, once it's done, this is all average so that we get the total loss for the sequence. Now, this is the loss that we want the model to look at and correct itself on. And so this is the loss value that we want to have the model correct itself on and get that loss lower. So the next step that happens for the model to know where it went wrong and how we can update it is the model does a backpropagation step. What this essentially does is it steps back through all the uh, layers and kind of works out gradients. How much was it actually wrong? And uh, this is done in a very intuitive way. Now, if you want to learn more about the math of how all these gradients are calculated, I'll leave an extra resource here in the description of the video, which is a great resource to go and follow and see how mathematically all these things also work with backpropagation. But essentially, all that happens is the model steps and kind of works out the gradients, the degree of how wrong these weights were. And now that it has that, we can now go and optimize and update these weights. Adam is an optimizer that's usually used for this step where it goes and it just simply goes and tweaks the little weights and, and dials and all these parameters that it has, especially in the trainable steps, such as in the embeddings or also in the self-attention layers and of course the logits. And so just to recap, so once the gradients are calculated, the batches have ran and Adam Optimizer has updated these weights, we can now say that the model ran through uh, a training stage, right? And basically has become a little bit smarter so that when the next time it runs through some data again, it's going to have more context about the previously optimized weights now and have a much easier time to get that loss closer to zero. And like we said, the whole purpose here is not to get it to zero, um, 100%, we want it close to zero, but not at zero. And as it continues to run through the cycles, the epochs, it will get smarter with more data and getting a bit more accurate into generating and predicting the next token. That's all we need to remember is that large language models, like these transformer-based decoder models, their only job is to predict the next viable token. It's all about that probabilities and math. So that being said, I hope you enjoyed this video today. I do have some extra resources in the description if you want to deep dive into how these systems work from a much more mathematical um, point of view. So go and watch them as well. In the next videos, I'm going to continue learning AI. And I hope these videos are helping you out as much as it's helping me to try and learn more about AI. So till next time, I'll see you in the next video. Cheers for now.